Welcome to Let's Talk Kashrus. We are privileged to be joined today by Rabbi Tzvi Haber, Director of Community Kashrus at the COR Kashrus Council of Canada. Thank you, Rabbi Haber, for joining us. It's a great pleasure, Rabbi really Hissiger. appreciate it. There are other issues such as lemons, and uh, to, to talk about those. Yeah, the, 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 one of the very serious issues about bars, and it's not even an issue that people think of, is that bars are situated inside non-kosher venues. Hotels, banquet halls, any type of non-kosher venue, the bartender, which like we said, is provided by the venue itself, is accustomed to going right into the kitchen, the non-kosher kitchen, where his lemons and his limes are stored, going into the fridge and taking the lemons and limes. Now he's got his knife, most bartenders like to use their own knife, and he'll cut the lemon and lime in the non-kosher kitchen, and he'll bring out the slices into the bar. At that point, the mashkiach is going to be very busy with many things happening at the event. He's not a mashkiach tamidi at the bar. So it's going to be very difficult at a certain point to determine where and how these, these lemons and, and limes are cut. Now, lemons and limes, al pidin, are a dover charif, and even though the knife, when it's cutting, is not hot, but a dover charif, we know, is, does absorb from a non-kosher knife because of duch de sakina, because the knife cuts it. So these are principles which then make the, the lemons and limes not kosher. Because we're afraid that what? That the knife was used for tarfus? For tarfus, for non-kosher stuff. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's possible that the lemons and limes could be non-kosher. So the Meshkech has to be very, very much aware of what could possibly happen. And especially in an, in an unsupervised bar where there is no meshkiach, these are things that can happen all the time. It's like People in a hotel, a hotel lobby, a hotel bar, someone's going out on a date. Obviously, they have the same issue. Yeah. But so would the A to B to ask them not to, use, not to put in a lemon? Is that kind of the, the easy answer? Definitely. When, when people go out on a shidduch date or whatever it is, they're going to a hotel lobby, they're ordering a drink, a water. Again, they're going to they, they probably use a glass from the hotel because it's cold. And they have to say, hold the lemon. Don't, don't put a, a cut lemon into my drink because the lemon might be not kosher. So it's absolutely imperative for someone to have a mashkiach at an, at an event. Besides for all the other kosher issues, just for the bar alone, the issues that you've enumerated make it clear how important it is to have someone supervising. It's 100% true. Unsupervised events, anything could go wrong. I'll tell you a story. There was, uh, there was a guy who was at an unsupervised event. It was, a, it was a tea or one of these types of events to raise some money in the community. And he, there, was, there was a mashkiach there at, at the event, but just as a guest. He wasn't supervising. So the person came over to him. In one hand, he was eating a hamburger. And in the other hand, he had Canada Dry Ginger Ale. And the Canada Dry Ginger Ale had no heksher on it. In Canada, there's no heksher on the bottle. So he asked the mashkiach, do you know if the Canada Dry Ginger Ale is kosher? It doesn't have any heksher on it. The mashkiach responded to him. He says, silly, you're eating a hamburger at an unsupervised event. Do you know where that came from? Who the caterer was and whose kitchen that was prepared? And you're asking me about ginger ale? There's a lot of issues that can go on at unsupervised events, but we're speaking here only about bars. Firstly, the question is that everyone has to ask themselves is, what's your standard? If there's no mashkiach, you're the mashkiach. You're responsible for what goes into your mouth. So are they serving scotch that was aged in sherry casks? If so, are you comfortable with that? Did you ask your rav? Did you talk to your paisik mm -hmm. to understand what his opinion is on the matter, what about beer? People think that what could be wrong with beer? Right. It was always, there was no issues. We, we always hear, especially people think that as long as a beer is a domestic made beer, then it's fine even, even without Ashkacha. Right, and it might be the case, be. but right. there are lots of problems. For example, today there's lots and lots of microbreweries. People even make beer in their basements, in their own homes. And they do lots of different creative things like flavored beers, oyster flavored, bacon, clam flavored, lob, lob, lobster flavor in beer. And they're taking the real, these real dvarm tameyim, machalas asuras, 
and they're using them, and they're using the same pots, and they're using the same processes, and even if you're drinking the unflavored beer, how do you know what kalim were used in that scenario? Did you ask a Shiloh? What about dairy beer? Did you ever hear of dairy beer before? There is such a thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think the reason is that so many people who maybe have not done the research assume that alcoholic beverages are automatically kosher? There seems to be, some, some, among part of the populace anyway, there seems to be that assumption. Why do you think that is? It's, it's not a, a wrong assumption. There's, it's not a misconception. There, the alcoholic industry, the beverages, have always been standardized and the manufacturing processes have always been the same. In many countries, the ingredients and the processes are even enshrined in law. Mm -hmm. Scotch, you can look it up on the internet, has a definition of what you can call scotch. Bourbon, the same. There's, there's only a limit of what you can do with, with those machal. So we're, we're relying on the FDA enforcement that whatever it is that you're required to put in. It's even more than that. It's a definition of the drink what this is. And that's why people always assumed that it was fine. And even in Shulchan Aruch and in the Ramah, you'll find in Yeridea that, they, that we're allowed to assume things that have a cheskes kashras, drinks. We're allowed to assume in certain instances that they didn't add wine that's not kosher, etc. There's even a Ramah that talks about barrels that are smeared with lard and that people used to do that and then asks why are we allowed to drink beer from such barrels and gives a reason why it's still okay. Mm -hmm. However, you have to understand that in the contemporary world, everything changed. The dynamics of the industry changed. And even though there's a lot that had stayed the same and that you could be Saimechan in the, in the industry of alcohol, but a lot has changed. And many of the different drinks out there are, have become problematic. Even Canadian whiskey, where, I, where I'm from, Canadian whiskey, can and many brands do have non-kosher wine mixed into them. Mm -hmm. Now the, I know there are other issues with uh, drinks and bars like cappuccino machines, things like that. T talk about those and what problems and challenges they present. Sure. There's lots of third-party providers like event providers. If you you want to order a cappuccino machine to your, your house party or your event that you're having, your Sheva Brachas, whatever you're doing. People come, the cappuccino machine, and they serve. People think, what could be wrong with a cappuccino machine? But, and maybe sometimes, it doesn't take all that much to kasher, but you have to have the know-how. There's, there's chal of akum that they could use. There's, there, it's milchiks. Maybe your event is fleshiks. You have to at least know if you can kasher the machine. The bartenders use Worcester sauce that's, even if it's kosher, is fish, and you're going to drink that together. You can, they mix it into the drinks, and you're going to drink that together with, with meat. You have to be very careful. You just have to know what it is that you're doing. A lot of the bartenders have their own shakers, these metal containers that they shake the drinks with. Are they kosher? Do they have any blias? That's not glass. You don't have the same heterim. You can't use metal that has blias of dvar masurim or that was washed in non-kosher dishwashers. They even use mint. Fresh mint, which is known to be infested with toloyim, with worms and insects. Who's washing it? Who's checking it? There's so many things that come up. So you've given us uh, t tons of information here. Uh, very interesting insights. What's the let's talk kashras takeaway so that we could keep the bar high, so to speak, when it comes to our standards of kashras, specifically in regards to spirits and bars? Rabbi Hissiger, if there's one message that I'd like consumers and guests and Bali Simcha to take home from this talk, it's that they are responsible for what they put in their mouth. The, the, the world today has gotten very used to conscious agencies certifying restaurants and hotels and venues, and you can get anything in these places. And when you go to those events, you're relying fully on the conscious agency. However, when you bring it home, or you go out to a venue that has no hashgacha, and it's unsupervised, and you don't know what you're putting in, in your mouth, then you are ultimately responsible. So get on the phone, speak to your Rav, Go to the base medrash, learn some of these sugyas, 
go and research some of these topics and what you'll find will likely surprise you. It's, it's, a, it's a very important message that you're sending. Here at Let's Talk Kashrus, we stress that our viewers should become educated consumers. At the end of the day, that will enable them to maintain the highest standards of Kashrus and Hashem with the help of professionals, experts, Rabbonim like yourself. Thank you, Rabbi Heber, so much for your time. And thank you for having me. He wrote some that there should be, never be any mikshal that should go out mitachas yadin. Amen. Thank you.